Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hey, look, that's the thing that I was hoping for. Anyway, good. Yeah. Glad you did it. Glad you guys could make it out here today. Um, so I, I had been my intention to do a couple of weeks in the in the Psalms. Uh, and I was going to call it Praying Through the Psalms. Uh, before Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, God had inspired men like Moses and David and the sons of Korah and Asaph and some of those other guys. And they put together a collection of works. And here we talk about this again next week. That you have come to know as the Book of Psalms. And they are the Old Testament a book of prayer. And so I thought we might benefit from a little bit of that. Now, this morning, we have uh, as our guest, my friend and colleague, Rabbi Steve Fenley from Congregation Shir Shalom, who has graciously offered to lead us walk through one of them this morning. So I was going to go with us, but his, his schedule didn't permit that. So we're going to introduce Steve this morning. Please give him a warm welcome. So wow, really uh, beautiful uh, words that were shared earlier. Thank you. Uh, really hit the uh, nail on the head talking about change. Um, talking about, you know, I guess I, I took my, my takeaway from that is that faith is good, but faith is not enough. We're not, this is kind of good. Faith is not enough. It requires our discipline as well. So whether it's mind, body, or spirit, Wherever we seek change, um, we have to set the bar higher and, uh, and get our marks to achieve that. Um, and that's work. It's not easy. I would arguably say that change is probably the hardest thing. And it's also at the same time the most inevitable. Okay, so with this, I'm going to talk about the... Uh, a psalm from the book of Psalms. I'm going to do a handout in a second. <clears throat> but I have a question for you. I'm going to start a psalm and let's see if you, just the first line, let's see if you can finish it. Just that first sentence. The Lord is my shepherd. Wow. Scott, quite a flock you've got here. Yeah, that's a very base my opinion just on that, I would say that you're scholars. <laughs> so um, here is the 23rd Psalm. You want to help out, Scott? Sure, of course. Okay. So while well, that handout is going out, um, so we're going to talk about Psalm 23. So what you have there is transliteration on the top and the King James version of the uh, the translation on the bottom. And the purpose of, um, of me explaining a little bit about Psalm 23, originally written in the Hebrew, was because, in my opinion, some of it gets lost in translation. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, we're going to go through it uh, line by line, uh, 15 lines, arguably, probably, uh, the most popular that we can call a chapter of all of, um, all of the Bible. And it's the one chapter that most people know. Or at least could um, repeat, if I were to repeat it, read it, and you didn't have the script in front of you, you could probably repeat it with me just as much as you could sing a song that you're not sure of all the words, but if someone sings it, you can sing along. So why is that? That's fascinating. Why does Psalm 23 out of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of the prophets, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the book of Ruth, Esther, right? Why Psalm 23? And there's a hundred, what about the other 149 Psalms? Why does this one rise above all? Right? It's a great question. So part of the um, Part of what I want to accomplish in the next few minutes, right, magically, is uh, maybe you'll have a better understanding of why this song, song goes above all. So, um, the, 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 let's look at the first line. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, when I'm reading Hebrew, just know that it's the line that's translated at the top. So, I'm not going to read 
Alright, we translated it as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now you probably have seen other translations such as I lack nothing, right? Or I shall not lack. And that's actually the more liberal translation. That sorrow is I shall not lack, right? I don't lack anything. Which in my opinion is a better translation because of course we want. It's our human nature. We spoke about that before. And uh, here we talked about the, uh, getting closer to God. We want a lot of things. Right? Of course we do. But if the Lord is my shepherd, then I, I don't like anything I need, is the point. Everything I need, right, the Lord will provide for me. Of course, i got to be doing the right things for the right reasons. Hopefully God will provide me you know, the basics, shelter, safe, sense of safety and security, food, right? And from there we can thrive if we have faith in the Lord. So, um, what I saw literally means I shall not lack. Be not deshigar mitseni alene uchot in ahaleni, verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. So, makes me lie down is not what the Hebrew says. Almost, but it doesn't catch the most important word, Yadavitseni, right? Which is translated as to lie down. Yadavitseni is much more than lie down. And I can't think of how to express it except to show you. It's to when you, if you've ever done this before, you will imagine yourself lying down in a green pasture, right? I want you to imagine it's a beautiful sunny day, Put a blanket down, and you lie down, you go, ah, and you stretch. And you feel that stretch all over the place. Not worry or care in the world for a couple of minutes while you just stretch and relax. Right? That is the argument saving. Okay, so you can just imagine how that's more, much more powerful than to lie down. It's to be at ease and to stretch and to yawn hear your muscles crack a little bit and, 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 and that just complete feeling to let yourself go. Now that's a certain amount of freedom. That's a, that's, that's a strong safe sense of safety of your surroundings. Remember, the Lord is my shepherd. Someone's watching over me. Someone's allowing me that freedom. So first thing that I want you to maybe appreciate is the imagery of this and the literary devices. By opening up with the Lord is my shepherd, wow, what an image. The Lord is my shepherd, and I'm the flock, wow, how protected am I? How safe am I? To the fact that I can rest, close my eyes, in the middle of the pasture. And uh, the second part of that sentence, be not to deshit, be not the deshi He leads me beside still waters. So still waters is a good translation. Many uchot. That adds some also some imagery. The word menucha uchot is actually rest, not still, but rest. Kind of the same, but a little bit different also. So I want you to imagine, again, the imagery of Psalm 23. Imagine waters resting. Uh, just waters resting. Meimin chot. The waters are resting. And even the waters not only still, but they're at rest beside you. Just the soft sound of almost an effortless trickle. That's the imagery of Meimin chot in Leaving the side is resting, soft, still, very trickling water. It's a beautiful imagery. And now she is so better at line three. Um, now she is so better, he restores my soul. We often translate it. So now she is so better, the Hebrew is a bit of a play on words. Now she is so better. Nafshi literally means my soul, right? Yishovev is more than restores my soul. Yishovev means 
that he returns my soul. Right? From the word teshiva, repentance. So not restores my soul, but returns my soul. And uh, can anyone guess where I'm being returned to? Towards my shepherd. Right? So it's a bit of a rest restoration, but we really have to think of that imagery of my soul as I rest in this green pasture, besides these very waters that are also resting right next to me. I'm having a spiritual moment. I'm being drawn closer to God. And the Hebrew, the word Yeshua, but it's also Hebrew is a play on words because the word Shabbat, which comes from the same root, means to be playful. So there's also that just nice kind of play on words. That here I am, I'm resting, the waters are resting, the green pasture, I'm breathing easy, I'm stretching, I feel safe and secure, the Lord is my shepherd, I'm feeling close to God, and I'm at play. That's freedom. Um, the next line, the uh, he guides me in straight paths for his name's sake. So this particular line is probably um, for a very good reason not translated correctly, but for a very good reason. Um, it's actually quite far from the Hebrew. So the Hebrew actually says, he guides me the male magdalet sedek. Maglai Tzedek is not um, it is straight paths. On the contrary, it literally means circles of justice or roundabout ways. So one may ask, wow, that's such a far, far translation, circles of justice, to righteous path or straight paths. Why? So the answer is, for whom was this written? For whom was it translated? Right, when this was being translated in the English for the King James Version. So we're talking to, about farmers. We're talking about merchants. We're talking about simple people, right? I don't consider myself a simple person. If someone tells me, the Lord guides me on straight paths, I say, that I understand. I know what a straight path is. I know that the quickest point from point A to B is a straight path. That I get. But if someone were to tell me the Lord guide me to circles of justice, I'm going to scratch my head. Okay, I know, I kind of know what you're talking about. I certainly know justice, but the circle, maybe. So I think that's a much better translation to say, he guides me in straight paths for his name's sake. I get it. I know what a straight path is. But I've also seen translations roundabout paths. So there we have to stop and think for a second. Why do some translators in the Christian Bible write roundabout paths instead of straight paths? That part I also get, because when I think of the Israelites, when they escaped uh, Egypt into the desert, they took a roundabout path to get to the promised land. Right? So while getting to point A, from point A to B may be the quickest way, not always the best way. All right? We all know about detours. Why are we, we being detoured? Well, there's a fire, or there's an accident, or there's road damage. Right? It's for a good reason. So sometimes roundabout paths are the right way to go. So the bottom line is on that particular um, Line, he guides me in straight paths for his namesake, not quite what the Hebrew says, but it's for a good reason. And uh, something happens when we continue on. Does anyone know, does anyone kind of see something kind of obvious as we get to line four? In the English, yet I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It's not peaceful anymore, I guess. That's a good one. There's a couple of things that happen. There's a shift, right? 
Now, the psalmist, the one that wrote this, he's talking to God. So lines one, two, three, he's talking about his shepherd. And now the voice is changing. Second person talking to you. Right? First person talking to you. First person and second person. Right? For thou, you, are with me. So yea, though I walk through the valley of donkey, you let the gates out of my lips, valley of death. Lo, you are alive, I will fear no evil. Kieta imadi, you are standing next to me. Great translation. I will fear no evil because you are with me. You are alive in your stead. You are alive. He's talking now to God. Right? God is talking about God in the beginning. Now he's saying, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Shiftacha umishantecha, heina they enachamu, they will give me comfort. So, question, why the rod and the staff? Is our shepherd holding two separate pieces of, and we've seen a shepherd with a staff, right? Uh, we've seen shepherd with a rod, I guess. I think the word staff comes to mind first. But why are they why are there two? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What do those two what kind of imagery do we feel with those two? Two different instruments. Thy rod and thy staff. And it's a good translation, right? Shiftacha umishandecha hena thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. So one one is uh, a rod of correction. A rod of correction. So very good in the right direction. Rod of correction. The other one is one for leading you. Okay, so uh, very good. You must have studied the Psalm 23. <laughs> so here is the 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 the, uh, the understanding. Right? A rod is something like a disciplinary. Right? Sometimes the shepherd needs to give you a little poke, a little push, a little prod to get you in the right way. And I think parents among us know that sometimes our children need to be slightly directed. Right? They're running away from us and uh, we've got to bring them back this way. Right? That's our shepherd. That's what we see a shepherd do. And I've seen many shepherds living in the land of Israel. And I've seen how they guide their flock. Right? They'll come over here and give one on the end a little tap. So that's what a rod is, a disciplinary um, stick. Right? To get his flock and rid the flock. So metaphorically speaking, sometimes we get a little wake-up call. Right? That's a God talking to us. Right? We almost had an accident because we were texting. Whoa. Whew. Right? That's God giving us a little push, a little prod, a little nudge. Right? Which we need. We're human. And by definition, we're, we're full of flaws. We're full of shortcomings. And having faith in God and bringing God into our lives, sometimes we need a little push and a prod. That's what the staff is for. But the, um, the rod. So what about the staff, though? It's called a mishantecha, a staff. A staff, in Hebrew, a mishantecha, if you can imagine the shepherd holding his, his uh, stick and leaning on it. Right? Just imagine your shepherd kind of going like this, leaning. What imagery does that provide for you? Anyone want to share if you're a sh if you're part of the flock and you see your shepherd relaxing just imagine that for a minute you see your shepherd relaxing what does that tell you yes sir ma'am security absolutely if my shepherd is resting all must be well right if you see your shepherd suddenly go like this, and I'll let it go, oh my goodness, what's going on? But your shepherd is resting, right? Uh, and a mishan, mishan techa is the Hebrew, thy staff, right? And a mishan in Hebrew is literally 
that thing that you're resting your backs on right now. Right? This is a Vishan. So that means that you're resting. If someone who's not resting on the, on the back there and you feel the movement more, you're ready to jump. Right? But if you put your back up against the, the what do you call this? Yeah, the pew with this part. The back of the pew. <laughs> well, it's called the Nishan Betha in Hebrew. Or Nishan. Um, yeah, so it says that they brought in their staff that comfort me. So I'm comforted by the fact that I get prods and pushes from God because God's watching over me. I'm also comforted when I see God grasp my shepherd, the leaning on his staff. Like you said, I feel safe. So the imagery here is fascinating. And then we get to line five. Beautiful imagery. So first of all, God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Um, let's talk about that for a second. What kind of imagery is that? What do you sense? What do you feel? What's this all about? Why is God doing this? Am I for this? Am I against it? One thing to bring me in the presence of my enemy. Sitting at a table. It's almost like a banquet, right? And the Hebrew, Tarot of the Nash Shulchan, Negat Sobarai, that prepares the table before me. So, what do we usually have on the table? For a meal. Okay. If we're not doing our homework, it's either you know, a laptop or a meal. So the, the imagery here is I'm sitting down with my enemies. What's the point? We're breaking bread. That's God's work. God has taken all of my enemies and sat them down in front of me. Right? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The enemies are not just watching. We're sitting, according to the Hebrew. Can you imagine what a life that would be if all of our resentments, all of our grudges, all of our angers, all of our, God forbid, hatred was washed away? The idea here is that, um, that it's not about us for a moment. Anyone towards whom we have a regret or a resentment or an anger or a grudge, we enter their hearts. According to the Hebrew, we enter their hearts. What burdens are they carrying? Maybe the way that they're acting towards me has nothing to do Maybe they're dying of cancer. Maybe they just found out that another's dying of cancer. So they're angry, they're agitated, they're impatient, they're intolerant. But it actually has nothing to do with me. So we suddenly become, in the presence of our enemies, according to Hebrew, Hebrew, ego free. No ego. No ego. Because it's not about me. It's suddenly not about me. So if someone's just shouting at us, this line here encourages us to say, I can see why you might get be upset, but the level of your anger seems to be a bit severe. Is, is everything okay? Are you all right? Would you like to talk? As opposed to, hey, you're not going to talk to me that way. It's not about us. And that's what this line says. Come and sit with your enemies and break bread with them. Because that's the healer and they will no longer be your enemies. And then of course, 
You anoint my head with oil, Kishanta Bashem and Oshi, perfect translation. But what's the imagery there? Right? Who gets anointed with oil? Prophets, kings, right? Queens. This is beautiful imagery because once we are with our enemies, we are a king, we are masters of our domain. Right? We are no ego, we have our God, and that's all we need. If I could only I'm going to teach you five syllables. Kosi Rivaya. Literally means my cup runneth over. So if someone asks you to want to take this piece of paper, you can practice it. You get prepared when someone asks you, Mom, say, how do you go? You can answer the quote, Kosiba Daya. That's the original biblical Hebrew. Right? A few thousand years old. Kosiba Daya. Ah, my cup runneth over. Right? I'm healthy. Okay, and in closing, Surely um, <coughs> goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, which is a pretty good translation.
So I'm going to teach you, a, I'm going to uh, teach for you a song that's probably well known, but you might not know what it means. Can we connect right here?
Thank you. 